Now, Ask Dr. Love with psychotherapist, author, love and relationship expert, Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. For expert advice on love and relationships, call into the show at 888-463-6748. That's 888-GO-FOR-IT. Or you can submit your question online at AskDrLove.com. Now, here's Dr. Love. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Dr. Love. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and I want to welcome you once again to my show. Today's topic is called, Is Too Much Honesty Ruining Your Relationship? Question for you. Are you someone who buys into the adage that honesty is the best policy? And when you had it, does your tongue transform into a weapon of mass destruction? Well, don't kid yourself. You don't need to use swords or guns to mortally wound those closest to you. Words cut like knives, and you can easily bury your relationship with one slice of that truthful tongue. So in this show, I'm going to explain why honesty isn't always the best policy and why continuing on the path of full disclosure could put a permanent closure on your relationship. So stay tuned for the skinny on honesty and find out my guidelines for when to speak the truth and when to button your lip. And then later in the show, I'm going to do some questions that were submitted to my site that I selected to answer. The first one's called Mindset Readjustment. And in this question, I'm helping out a young man who wor- who wants to know how to stop being upset by his long-distance workaholic girlfriend's refusal to take time to talk with him. So stick around for my surprising answer, which consists of having him use rather than ignore his feelings to bring them closer. And in the question, I am a mess, I help out a woman whose formerly wonderful husband has turned into the evil Mr. Hyde, who now frequently tans her hide with his vicious words and actions. And she wants to know how she can return to the bliss of the early days when they were best friends who laughed and loved a lot. So, you know, research says couples that loved each other in the good old days have a good chance of resurrecting their old feelings. So stay tuned to find out how she can tell if this happy outcome is in the cards for her or not. And then I'm going to do a reading between the sheets segment. This is where I put those tough sexual problems to bed. And in this question, it's called, It is Complicated. I advise a woman who allowed a strange man to screw her on a public sink. I should say pubic sink, but but seriously. Now she has the sinking feeling that she might be a submissive. So stick around to see how I flush out what this incident reveals about herself. So now let's get on to today's topic, the truth about honesty. Getting it off your chest, venting, expressing yourself, airing your feelings, just being honest. They're all expressions you've heard or used yourself. But did you know that all these expressions are glorified forms of self-indulgence? Now, what on earth do I mean? Well, in a nutshell, when feelings build up, it's frustrating to sit on them, and it feels damn good to release them. That feel-good sensation is a form of self-gratification. It's like taking a poop. Ah, there's a release of pressure. But when you dump emotional turds on others, it's no different than literally pooping on them. It's a sad fact that our education at home and in school doesn't include learning how to control our impulses. And the result is that most humans act out their negative feelings using hostile actions and words. Now, I call the dysfunctional ways that people release and act out their anger fight traps. And these traps consist of Open warfare, like name-calling, character assassination, put-downs, and sarcasm, just to name a few. And secret warfare, such as silent treatment, I forgot, recruiting allies, and so on. I give you a full list of these fight traps until death do us part so you can recognize them. But when it comes to acting out our aggression... The point I want you to remember is there's a continuum of dumping that ranges from outright violence, slapping, kicking, punching a partner, to slamming doors and punching walls. And on the other end of the continuum are the subtler forms of aggression. So today I'm talking about the subtlest form of assault known to man, honesty. And you'll often hear people justifying and rationalizing and couching their hostile H-bombs with sentences like, I'm just being honest, when really the honesty is a gift-wrapped turd. Now, while we may feel temporarily better after taking a poop on somebody else's head, we pay a terrible price for this temporary release. Because when you act out, it harms your relationships 
and your own self-esteem because you can't feel proud of yourself when you harm others. Now, speaking about acted out aggression, I'm thinking about that Newtown massacre. How can I forget it? And the piece I wrote about this on psychologytoday.com. You know, the world is continuing to grieve this tragedy, and we obviously need to make sense of what happened and decipher what we're all meant to learn from this tragedy that can improve the world and ourselves as individuals. And we have to be aware of viewing this tragedy as simply a maniacal rampage of a chemically imbalanced, psychotic madman set adrift by our faulty diagnostic methods. Because in reality, this bloodbath magnifies what ails the world, the human race, every society and nation, and each of us as individuals. It's actually a lens that magnifies the violence that's occurring on a worldwide scale in the wars of religion and territory and even down to our most intimate relationships where we lash out and even kill those we supposedly love in various symbolic ways, not to mention the way we shoot off rounds at each other in the name of honesty. My point is rage spews out in gunfire when fists smash into walls or faces, and when we, when we take shots at each other with our words. It all comes down to acting out rage to a greater or lesser extent. And my point is, we're all being destroyed by mismanaged rage. Let me just tell you, humans, we're all born with two instincts, the life and the death instinct. The death instinct, or thanatos, is the source of aggression and hostility between people. Rage is an instinctual reaction that arises whenever we feel threatened or endangered. And if we allow our rage to be bottled up, it festers and places us in in danger of blowing. I call this the blivet, 50 pounds of poop in a five pound bag. Keep shoving more and more feelings into the bag and it'll eventually break. Now we have to add impulse control to this mix because the stronger our impulse control skills are, the better we're able to contain our rage and not act out. And the weaker our skills, the shorter our fuses are going to be and the less time it takes before we blow. A lot of bottled up rage and poor impulse control skills is the formula for disaster. And when rage is turned back on the self, we see Mental and emotional symptoms like depression, anxiety, self-destructive actions like drinking, smoking, reckless driving, masochism, and even suicide. That's the ultimate rage turned back on the self. But when rage is turned away from the self, we see it directed against others. And the rage that rages on a worldwide scale is ultimately the result of our collective failure to love each other properly. And this failure exists at the level of the individual family, and it bleeds outward from there to the entire world. And by the way, rage is never the primary emotion. When we become angry, it's because we feel other more basic and vulnerable feelings such as hurt or sadness or fear. And we don't want to feel those weak feelings, so we convert them into anger. Now, I can only imagine how many times poor Adam Lanza felt hurt that he was the, the Newtown gunman, how how often he felt hurt, sad and afraid. And who heard his pain? And how many years did his pain and anger fester and build until it morphed into the powder keg that exploded in gunfire? You know, Adam, in an odd way, could be seen as a messenger sent to alert all of us to the need to alter the way we handle our own angry feelings, to consider what we say before we speak, to ask ourselves how the other will feel before we say or do X, Y, or Z, to consider whether what we intend to say or do will be helpful or constructive to the other person in our relationship or not. And you have to remember that whatever you say or do boomerang back on you. And we all have to work to cultivate the ability to be more patient, to listen to those who are angry with us, and to help them to feel truly heard and understood, which in most cases resolves angry feelings and whatever conflict is going on. And I also want to say, as we continue to grieve this event, we might also say a prayer of thanks to all the sacrificial lambs who died in the massacre, because they themselves were also messengers chosen to give us all a serious wake-up call by putting this world's failings in sharp relief. So the bottom line is we all have to learn to channel our negative feelings into constructive communications. And we're all being asked to answer the call to be more selfless and listen with the ears of our hearts, to empathize and embrace others, even when we're angry ourselves. And this skill requires that impulse control I was talking about. You know, whenever I talk about impulse control, I think about this guy who came to me about 30 years ago. 
he was married to uh, the daughter of a very famous family, and he was a flasher, and he had been arrested, literally, for whipping it out in the street in New York City. And the first thing I said to this guy was, if you want to heal your problem, you've got to make the commitment to sit on it, literally, keep it in your pants, and don't act on impulse. And then when the feelings build up, we'll be able to talk about it and work it through and understand whatever the unconscious motivations are that are making you do this. But if you act out and you discharge your feelings, we'll never get to the bottom of the problem. So developing impulse control is no different from lifting weights in the gym. At first, you can't bear any weight at all. Your muscles are just weak. And the same thing occurs when you try to control your emotional expressions because you haven't built up any emotional muscle, meaning you can't bear the emotional weight. Now, the good news is by making a conscious resolution to never again dump raw feelings onto another person, even under the guise of just being honest, you can train yourself to bear your feelings and not dump onto another person. So if you want a solid relationship or romance, you got to keep it in your pants, just like the flasher. Keep your tongue in your pants. Now, people often ask me, what can happen to a person physically when he or she doesn't allow the release? Would a physical ailment develop? Now, this is a great question. And for years, it was believed that the release or the catharsis of anger is actually necessary to resolve your feelings. And more recently, we've discovered that emotional venting actually causes an emotional intensification, meaning if you vent anger, you actually become angrier. And for this reason, venting actually creates a greater risk of physical illness. So this being said, it's not healthy to ignore or brush angry feelings under your emotional rug. The entire focus of my work is to teach you constructive communication alternatives to venting and releasing raw emotions. Now, I'm also asked, why is it that psychologists and psychotherapists suggest that you have a good cry when you're sad in order to let out the grief, the pain, the anger, or whatever else you feel, so it doesn't stay bottled up? So why shouldn't people release their anger? After all, isn't there grief, pain, et cetera, and anger just as well? And am I suggesting that we transform ang- anger into a less dangerous, volatile, em- volatile emotion like sadness? Well, this is another great question, and again, I'm not suggesting that anyone bottle up anger, and nor should you transform anger into sadness. So to understand what I'm talking about, you want to think in nuances, in shades of gray, not in black and white, either or terms. Most people think there are only two options when it comes to anger, bottle it up or vent it. And bottling it up is very unhealthy for your mental health and your physical health. So what about the other extreme, the venting, the raging, the screaming, and the verbally attacking the object of your anger? This also should not be done because it's a fallacy to think that anger is released through these various forms of venting. On the contrary, acted out rage is like kindling. It fuels more anger. And that is anger is self-feeding, and the more you vent, the angrier you become. And when you dump on someone else, the dumpy stores up anger and pays you back, which fuels even more anger and fighting. So I'm not saying that anyone should bottle up anger. No, what I'm saying is feel the feelings. And at the same time, don't act on the feeling. See the duality I'm talking about? You hold the feeling, but don't act. Then you filter the raw feeling through the sieve of your intellect. And like an alchemist, you transform the raw, red-hot emotional metal into pure gold. That's the communication that is not a raw expression of rage, but rather a constructive statement that honors both yourself and the other person. And doing what I advise is the opposite of bottling up a feeling. It's transforming and constructively using the feeling rather than dumping the raw feeling. And when you handle angry feelings constructively, you're going to see the positive effect it has on your relationship, and then the anger is going to truly dissipate. Now, let me just take a brief break. And when I come back, I'm going to tell you when you should be honest. So be right back in a moment on Ask Dr. Love. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. To speak to Dr. Turndorf live on the air, call 888-463-6748. AskDrLove.com is the web's premier relationship advice site since 1996. Visit AskDrLove.com to search thousands of free relationship advice articles on any relationship issue you may have. Or you can submit a question to her free advice column. However, if you're listening live, why not call in? Don't be shy. 
Dr. Turndorf wants to help you, and this is a unique chance to get a personal answer from one of today's most respected experts. So if you have a question for her, please call in now at 888-463-6748. That's 888-463-6748. Now back to Ask Dr. Love with Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Once again, here's Dr. Love. I'm talking about why honesty isn't always the best policy. And I was explaining before I took my break the difference between venting and expressing versus describing in a constructive way what you're feeling and why. Now, I also want to tell you, beware of any kind of therapies that invite you to split the session, taking turns splitting each other into two, because your relationship is going to end in Splitsville. You never want to vent on anybody you love or don't love. Now, I want to get to the question I promised to answer, which is, how can you know when to speak the truth and when to shut up? Here's your, your rule of thumb. Before you speak, you want to ask yourself whether you're, whether what you're about to say is going to be beneficial to the other person in your relationship. And if your answer is no, then button it. Cause you aren't supposed to gratify yourself and vent your feelings at somebody else's expense. Remember, even though it may feel good to release yourself in the moment, you're going to pay a terrible price because when you hurt your partner, your spouse, your friend, your parent, or your child, you are hurting yourself. The person you hurt with your vented rage, even couched in the form of simple honesty, is going to store up anger toward you and pay you back. Remember, whatever you say or do, boomerangs back on you. So there's only one way to use your anger constructively. Set limits and assert yourself by creating a constructive communication that benefits all parties. You know, I'm thinking about Something that happened to me quite a few years ago, I was asked to write a book with the father, the creator of modern group psychoanalysis, and I was sitting in his office discussing the book, and there was another man in the room who was a member of my professional group, and this man lived in California, and he would listen in on our groups oh, through the phone, and he flew in to talk about writing this book. So the guy says... You know, what I'm thinking is, since I'm not in the group and I often have trouble hearing, well, Jamie, why don't you just write up notes about what goes on and I'll review it and then I'll, you know, write it up and add the theory. And I was so angry that he was trying to turn me into some little, uh, little handmaiden. I was so furious. But again, I instantly converted the raw feeling into a constructive communication and I just simply set a limit and said, I'm not in this project to act as a recording secretary. So that's how I channeled that anger into a constructive, limit-setting self-assertion that was beneficial to all of us. Okay. Now, you know, my godmother told me when I first began airing the show, nobody wants to hear what you're saying. Look at all the reality shows out there where people are just destroying each other, pounding each other. I want you to know it takes all kinds to make up this world. And if you're listening to my show, reading my books and my columns at Ask Dr. Love, it's because you are in the process of evolving. You are the cream of the crop who has risen to the top of the gene pool. And by your own example, you are the pebble in the proverbial pond, and you can create a ripple effect that fans out to the entire world. So let me give you some tweets on my topic of honesty is not the best policy. Here's one. Honesty delivered by the fistful is nothing but a loaded missile. Here's another. Honesty is often an act of brutality. And another. Your relationship is at stake when honesty is allowed to bite like a snake. And another one. Don't be an unsuspecting schlub who used, uses honesty like a club. I like that one. And another, remember what you say and do always boomerangs back on you. That should be your mantra. And another, if your honesty lands like a hammer, it's time to put your tongue in the slammer. (laughs) And here's another, being honest to the bone can wreck a happy home. And another yet, use your gray matter and think before you verbally batter. And another, only say and do what you know will be helpful to your partner And you, getting it off your chest is not always what's the best. Words have the power to draw a relationship to its final hour. 
And here's another. Do your words have a dangerous trajectory that can only be cured by a tongue-ectomy? <laughs> and another. Whoever said honesty is the best policy is the cause of relationship disharmony. Be a love sleuth. Discover the mystery of when it's best to not share the truth. And another one. Muzzle your mouth or your relationship will go south. And yet another, a mouth that's an armored tank will make a relationship tank. And a mouth that fires like a rifle is not a mere trifle. For a relationship that makes it to the finish line, don't put your partner on the receiving end of the verbal firing line. And I promise you, I'm coming close to the finish line myself. If your mouth makes your partner run for cover, he or she soon this sounds like a tongue twister. Who slit sheets for the sheet slitter's daughter? Aren't you glad I didn't slip on that one? If your mouth makes your partner run for cover, he or she will soon be finding another. An honest airing of feeling may well leave your partner reeling. And honesty air raids backfire in spades. An honest tongue may leave your partner stung. To verbally tar and feather is more than a relationship can weather. Have a qualm and don't mindlessly drop an honesty bomb. And last but not least, I'm sure you're breathing a sigh of relief. Honesty isn't always the best policy. All right. You know, I was just thinking I wanted to tell you the story of my little sweet canary, Fluffy. He was a tiny little Norwich canary. And he came to me disabled. I didn't know he was sick. And as a result... He was often needing to be nursed by me, and so we got very close, and I literally taught this little bird how to talk. Even though canaries can't speak, he would wiggle his beak for the number of syllables that he would want to say. Yes, no, thank you, I love you. And one day, he got so angry with me, and I saw him hunker down, furrow his brow, his wings were out, and he started shooting across the perch in an attack mode. We got halfway across the, across the perch. His head snapped back as if a light bulb moment had occurred in this little mini brain. And by the time he got to the other end of the perch and reached me, instead of pecking me in anger, which he would do when he was angry, he kissed me on the cheek and wiggled his little beak, I love you. And that story always inspires me because it tells me if a tiny little canary can learn to control his impulses and mind his beak or his mouth, so can we all. All righty. Let me give you a question now that came to my website, and it's called Mindset Readjustment. Hello, Dr. Love. I'm in a pretty tough situation, and I'm not sure how to work it through. I love my girlfriend. She is my best friend, and when we are together, there is nothing we can't handle with a smile. However, after meeting in college as friends for about a year or two, eventually falling in love and spending almost two years living happily together, traveling around the world for grad school, life has thrown us a curveball, and we have to become long-distance lovers because of her work. And it's been like this for about five months now, and I'm afraid the distance is ruining everything. She's really busy working in a job that is beyond excellent for her career, and I'm so proud of her for getting where she is and tell her that often. The problem is, weekdays, weekends, night or day, she'll go days at a time without texting or emailing me, never Skypes, and when I suggest it, and she never calls anyway. And I am do doing literally all the communication work, and it makes me feel like she's losing interest in the relationship, or worse, in me. And I asked if she would consider moving back in together if I were to move to her. And she said that she did not want to because she was unsure and that because of the distance, she felt like we were on different pages in life. After some talking with her and some thinking on my own, I realized that when we are together geographically, she becomes more dependent than she naturally is. The distance brings out her strong, independent side, and she simply does not have the need for the level of communication and emo emotional intimacy that I do. And I, I read a response you wrote to another asker in which you said that he should work on not taking personally the way he interpreted his long distance girlfriend's need to spend a good deal of time alone. Well, what would I like, what I would like to know is this. How can I do this? Because I'll be honest, I'm very much the anxious type when it comes to romantic attachment. And I instinctively interpret ignored messages and days completely out of communication as her not having any desire to be connected with me, not caring about me and not wanting to be with me. And on the other hand, 
I know that she does love me, does want to be with me, and certainly isn't cheating on me or anything. We spent almost an entire week together over the holidays, and things went almost perfectly. And so I want to get over this irrational fear and be able to feel more comfortable, at least for as long as the distance lasts, with the way she connects. And I really want to be with her, and I'm willing to learn how to meet her halfway on this. So how can I change the way I feel to be in sync with this um, with this woman who I love very, very much, and she's very emotionally independent. And you sign it, distance makes the heart grow lonely. Okay. Now, look, this is a very clearly presented but a deeply complex story. So first off, I want you to know that you're experiencing what's called a molar conflict. And I don't mean that your teeth are on edge because if anything, a molar conflict creates a pain in another part of your body. But seriously, this term refers to conflicts surrounding intimacy needs. So I think it's fair to say that you need a heck of a lot more emotional communication and contact than your girlfriend. And that's not wrong or right. That's just who you are. Okay, what's interesting is the fact that these differences didn't seem to show up when you lived together during that two-year period. So from what you say, the relationship worked fine. So I'm wondering if the reason the relationship clicked back then was because she didn't have a demanding job. And now that she does, she's willing to allow the relationship to take a backseat to her work. And if I'm correct, you're going to continue to have the same problem even if you were to live closer or live together. So in both cases, she's going to put work first and she's not going to vote, devote time to the relationship. I have to also tell you, I'm hearing conflicting messages because on the one hand, you seem to be saying that when you were together for a week over the holidays, everything was back to being perfect. So was that only because it was holiday time and she wasn't working her normal schedule? Now, as perfect as it seemed recently, when you asked her if she wanted you to move in with her, she refused your offer, saying that the long distance has revealed you're on different pages. So when I heard that, I started to feel worried that the distance has made her start to think that you aren't compatible. Now, let's be real here. It doesn't take that much time to touch base by phone or Skype. And it sounds to me like she's not making the effort to even give you a crumb of attention. And by the way, her behavior goes beyond independence. It's off-putting. And I think this is why you're feeling pushed away. And just so you know, you have the right feeling. Now, to answer your question, uh, how can you get rid of your feelings? That's not the right question to ask. You shouldn't try to manhandle your emotions and get rid of them. Emotions are springing from your soul and they're ringing a warning bell that you should not ignore because they're telling you something isn't right here and that you truly aren't on the same page. And her willingness to put work ahead of the relationship is a deal breaker. Okay. Now that said, I do encourage you to do your own self work, to identify the old scar that's lurking from your childhood. Use my book till death do us part, unless I kill you first, to help you identify your wound. And I bet you're going to discover that you were emotionally dismissed or abandoned as a boy. And this is why your unconscious chose a girl who is emotionally abandoned. It's familiar to you because we're all creatures of habit. And it's also a golden opportunity to help you heal your old scar. Now, as I repeatedly tell my listeners, my readers, my patients, the true purpose of our intimate relationships is to help each other heal our mutual old scars. And it's our highest and most divine calling on this earth earth to be healers to those close to us. But it rarely works out this way because for starters, we choose partners who recreate the deepest pains of our past. That's the repetition compulsion. And we do this because we're hoping to get from our partner the kind of love and attention we lacked as kids. And if we do, we'll feel that we finally got the healing and the right treatment from our parents and our old scars will feel feel healed. But the problem is most couples never reach this healing point because we choose partners who resemble the parents who let us down and they let us down in the exact same way that our parents did. And when we're let down, the emotional sparks fly, negative feelings and blame lead to more and more fighting rather than love and healing. And this is the real reason why most relationships and marriages fail. So the only way out of this vicious cycle is for you to be conscious, for you to consciously recognize your old scar and know what you need to heal it and then speak as an advocate for yourself, talking on behalf of the wounded child and stating what you need to heal. And this in turn will help your partner assist you in your healing and vice versa. And we're not going backwards and uncovering old scars just so we can wallow in the misery of the past. It's so we can mine the misery and use it to heal and move forward. 
And since we're injured in relationships, we need relationships to heal. And we can't do this healing alone. But here's the rub. In order to heal, you need a partner who's willing to be responsive and act as a healing agent. So you need a partner who's willing to help you feel wanted and loved despite her work obligations and the long distance. So you don't need any more dismissive behavior that's only going to re-injure rather than heal you. And I'm banking on the fact that your fear of abandonment which triggers your need for reassurance, triggers an old scar in her. And I bet she felt intruded upon by a controlling parent. And I'm thinking she feels angry to be demanded upon by you. And instead of admitting her anger, she acts it out by pulling away. Because the way she pulls away has an angry, withholding, and starving quality. So now what do we do? What you got to do is talk to her. And you don't want to pressure her into giving you what you want, but you want to have her and you gain more insight into the dance that's going on here. So you're going to talk about your old scar and you want her to own how she feels in response to your wishes for more. And if we get her talking about her feeling crowded and demanded upon and angry, she won't need to release her feelings through this indirect way of avoiding talking, which is just ruining your relationship. So I think you get the point. You talk to her. You might say that uh, you've been doing some self-reflection. You've realized that the distance, not blaming her, saying she's giving you no contact, just the distance has awakened a scar in you. Tell her what the scar is, and the distance reminds you of a parent who ignored you or whatever your story is. Tell her you have the sense that your request for more is pushing her away. And uh, if you know something about her history, insert it here. You might say, I think I'm reminding you of your controlling mom or whatever. Wait and see if she admits it. And then then explain to her that the problem with her expressing her annoyance by withdrawing is triggering triggering more anxiety in you, which is making you pr- pursue her for more contact, which only makes her withdraw more. And you're in a vicious cycle. And the only way for you to get out of the, this bind is for both of you to honestly state what you need. OK, I'm going to take a little brief break and I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. To speak to Dr. Turndorf live on the air, call 888-463-6748. That's 888-463-6748. If you like what you're hearing, you can learn about Dr. Turndorf's techniques for turning conflict into connection and healing in her critically acclaimed, groundbreaking book, Till Death Do Us Part, Unless I Kill You First, a step-by-step guide for resolving relationship conflict. Find out more about this book and read a free excerpt by visiting AskDrLove.com. This is Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. And if you have a question for her, please call in now at 888-463-6748. This show is for you, the listeners, so please give her a call now. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Once again, here's Dr. Love. I was right in the middle of talking to a guy who's trying to figure out how to navigate this long-distance relationship with a girlfriend who seems to be withdrawing and refusing contact the more he asks for contact. So I was saying before the break, the only way to get out of this bind is for you both to honestly state what you need and for you both to do your best to respond to each other. So when you feel the need for contact, you say so. And if she is overcome with work and doesn't feel available for a connection, then she can say that. But, and here's the big but. I shouldn't say big but, right? Our worst fear. It's, um, my but is how she says no that has the power to break this vicious cycle and actually be healing for you for her and the relationship or not. And the healing will come, will come to you both if she says no with heart. Now, what do I mean by this? I, I created this expression that I call the emotional hamburger helper, helper. Do you know what the hamburger helper is? You know, it's that packaged product that makes a little bit of beef into a full meal. So my point is, even if she can't give you the time, you know, she can't give you the beef. If she gives you the right feeling and makes you feel loved and wanted, that will be more than enough because a little heart goes a long way. And if she does this, you won't feel nervous that you're losing her and you won't need to clutch after her. And then she'll stop feeling annoyed and you won't continue retreating and you'll feel less nervous and needy and you'll live happily ever after. So how this hamburger helper would sound 
would be something like, Honey, I know you want contact. You want to talk. And I really love talking to you. But I am just so slammed with work right now. Could we talk a little bit later? You see? So that way she's giving you the feeling she's not rejecting you. You won't be anxious. She'll still get her space. This is how you'll navigate it. Now, I've given you the complete blueprint for using the relationship to heal your mutual old scars. And as you help each other to heal your scars, your relationship is going to heal too. If you need further assistance on how to navigate this process, my book, Till Death to Us Part, is going to take you through all the steps. And if you also need a little one-on-one shot in the arm, don't hesitate hesitate to reach out to me in my private consulting division. All right. So this is a really, really long question that's coming. So brace yourself because it's um, it's a heartbreaking story. Dear Dr. Love, I sent you a message on your Facebook page a while back, and you said to contact you via this method, and I'm so lost. My marriage is completely deteriorated, so much so, filing the divorce papers is almost the only thing left to do. And the very first time I saw this man, I told my friend that I was with that I was going to marry him someday. And uh, I don't know if I can type everything, so I'm going to give you a short and sweet version so I'm not writing a novel. I essentially married my best friend. We were inseparable. We talked to each other for hours on end, so much so that we would giggle at night going to bed. Okay, stop talking. We have to go to sleep. And we'd laugh for hours until our guts and our faces hurts. And in the beginning, we rarely even had a disagreement, nonetheless a fight. And our sex life was great, really great. And we were best friends. All right, so I got PTSD from a fire and suffered with terrible anxiety and depression. And my parents are hoarders. And I was a daddy's girl, and I did a lot of acting out growing up. And my mother um, often punished me and threatened to sell my horse. I failed a drug test for marijuana when I was 13, and then I got drug tested every month after that. And she told me if I ever failed another test, she would sell my horse. And I did a 180 after that, and I spent every moment I could with that horse for many, many years. He himself as bipolar, anxiety, depression, and ADD. He had an alcoholic mother and grew up mostly institutionalized and in foster homes. He apparently had a very, very messy divorce. The court ordered him to do cleanup time in a rehab because of his drug addiction, and he started to to do drug tests if he wanted to see his daughter. Then he dated a crazy woman. This is a lot of stuff going on. And then you started fighting. Apparently, as a result of all the court problems, you started fighting and the fighting got worse. And he stopped taking his meds, hid in the room, didn't go to work for days on end. And he said he was sad because he missed his kids. And then in the beginning of September, you had the flu. You were in bed for two days. And then he came to your apartment in a rage. He started screaming at you, refusing to let the dogs out, refusing to help you. He punched a hole in the door. Uh, You got physical. You threw something at him. And uh, it was just a disaster. I'm reading this whole thing. The police were involved. You got evicted from your apartment. He's not paying rent. What else is this guy doing? This It's a very long question. Um, Because he didn't pay rent, you had to pay rent. You couldn't pay the rent, so you lied and told the landlord. uh, You told him that you had paid when you hadn't, and then when he found out, he lost it even more. You feel guilty over having lied. I see that. Then he stayed with you for a little while after you got evicted and you were in your new place, and then he would go to his mom for a couple of days and get irritated with her and come back. And this back and forth has been going on for three months now. And he would just get mad at you and take the iPad that he bought you for your birthday away. Then he gave it back and took it away, just like unbelievable. And then you got a text message from a number. And then it was this crazy woman he was dating who said that if you are married to this guy, why is he trying to hook up with me? Okay, so you're saying you love him, he's your best friend, but you feel like all he does is take, take, take. He's manipulative, impulsive, and lots of times when you fight, he's absolutely cruel and mean, and you can't stop loving him, and you want your husband, your happy husband, the happy husband you remember, and you hope I can help you out of this mess. All right, let me take a brief break. I got the gist of your your question, and when I come back, I'll answer your question. Back in a moment.
You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. To speak to Dr. Turndorf live on the air, call 888-463-6748. That's 888-463-6748. If you've recently been through a breakup and are looking for a second chance, wondering how you can reconcile with your ex, or if it's even possible after all you've been through, Dr. Turndorf's latest book, Make Up, Don't Break Up, presents her five-step plan for reconciling with your ex. This plan was developed out of years of research, working with thousands of couples at her Center for Emotional Communication. This is a proven no-hype and no-nonsense method that gets right to the root of the problem to guide you to the right path towards reigniting a lasting relationship. For more about Make Up, Don't Break Up, visit AskDrLove.com. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Once again, here's Dr. Love. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and I was having to clip the question that I received, and I hope you got the essence of it. Now, here's my answer. I do get that you love this guy. And, you know, people who are addicted to heroin love that too, even though it's killing them. And this guy might as well be heroin for you because you are addicted to a guy who is literally poison. This man is killing you. He's an addict. He's an impulsive abuser. He's manipulative. He sucks you dry. Now, I know you yearn for the good times you shared with your best friend, but the fact is you fell in love with this man's veneer, his outer layer, because all these other layers were hidden from you when you fell in love. These other aspects of his of his identity always existed, but they lay dormant beneath his veneer. And you just didn't see these layers because the stresses of life hadn't exposed them yet. So you fell in love with a mirage, not the real man. And so now you're idealizing the wonderful times and you're wishing to return to the good old days with this wonderful man. But there's no going home again. The cat is out of the bag. This man is never going to morph back into that mirage. The real man is now exposed. And the real man shows no interest in changing. And I'm saying this because I didn't hear anything that tells me that he wants to get help for his addictions, his emotional problems, his impulsivity. No, he just wants to gratify himself and dump on you. And I didn't even, you know, read out all the horrible things that he has said to you and done. And you need to save yourself. So I want you to start by reading Till Death Do Us Part and identify what old scar you're replaying in this relationship. And I couldn't help but notice how much like your mother he is in the way he took away your phone and the way your mother threatened to take away your horse. Now, when you identify the old scar that's still lurking in you, your next step is to heal it. And when you do heal it, you aren't going to want anything to do with this man. I promise you that. Now, I'm sorry your heart was so broken by him. But when you detox from this poisonous relationship, and I mean detox, you're going to start to feel better. And remember now, you're not supposed to be around anybody who is toxic to you. Only surround yourself with warm, supportive, and loving people. All right. Ah, sometimes when I hear these... um really painful stories, you know, because I, I I take it in and it's in my heart right now and I feel so sad. So I have to take a little bit of a breath. All right, so here's my question. Uh, this is an, on the reading between the sheets segment and it's called It Is Complicated. Hello, Dr. Turndorf. I am in a complicated situation and I need some advice. I just turned 17 and I am in a relationship with my second boyfriend for almost a year now. We have a good sex life and I was always satisfied and happy with him. Even though we do not experiment a lot, he brings me to orgasm regularly, which I cannot say about the first guys I had sex with. Two weeks ago, I was at a party and something happened. My boyfriend was not there. And there was a guy who kept staring at me the whole evening. And when I went to the bathroom, he just followed me in and locked the door behind him. I was so surprised, it, I did not know what to say. And he just turned me around and bent me over the sink. And he started touching me, and I got aroused, even though I was a little scared. He took me there while he held me down over the sink. It felt like I was in a dream. It was so strange. I did not really feel attached to myself anymore. The thing is that it felt good, really good. And I came twice. 
something that has never happened to me before. And both times it was better than any orgasm I have ever had before. After he was done, he just left. And when I got out of the bathroom, he was gone. I haven't told anyone about what happened, but I have thought about it a lot. I thought about if it was rape, but I did not struggle or cry for help. Actually, none of us ever spoke a word to each other, and I did enjoy it. And I thought if I should tell my boyfriend and if I should find out who the guy at the party was. And I'm sure I could get his number if I asked some of my friends, but I actually do not want my boyfriend or anyone else to find out about him yet, question mark. I think about him a lot, sometimes especially when I masturbate. And I thought about myself and what this means about me and my sexuality. Am I a submissive or something like that? And it was really the best sex I ever had. And he is a complete stranger to me. And I really don't know what to do and would appreciate some advice. And he was never rough or hurt me. And he did use a condom in case you were wondering. Signed, confused. All right. So here's the deal. A strange man bent you over the sink. And you were so in sync with the man that you came twice. First of all, you were totally complicit in the act. He didn't force you, so it wasn't rape. But at the same time, you described feeling like you were in a dream. Now, this sensation is a defense mechanism that's called detachment. You know, that kind of defense mechanism we see happening in periods of stress, for example, when someone is being raped and has the sense that she or he is detached from the body and looking at it outside the body as if in a dream. Now, the unconscious purpose of detachment is to put your feelings at a distance. Your mind did this because some part of you doesn't approve of what you did. So you just stepped out of yourself temporarily and entered a dream so you could screw this guy without compunction. Now, the most important aspect of this encounter is what it tells you about yourself. Now, the first thing is that you haven't fully reined in your impulses and that you are susceptible to gratifying yourself in ways that can be destructive. I mean, we don't know who this strange man was. He could have been the son of Sam. So... Having sex with a stranger, he could have been a stalker. It's dangerous. And the most destructive aspect of the event involves its impact on your relationship. Because obviously, telling your boyfriend the truth about your sink encounter may well sink your relationship, or at least cause it to start going down the drain. So if you tell him, for one thing, he's just not going to be able to trust you again. And not telling him means that you have to silently bear the guilt of your infidelity. So in both cases, the act is destructive either way. So as for the fact that you came like an open faucet, all that tells me is that the danger and the illicit aspect of the anonymous sex got your pipes flowing. And the fact that you don't come like this with your boyfriend really doesn't concern me that much because you can't compare the intensity of a forbidden sink screw with a stranger to a ho-hum screw on the box springs. So in answer to your question, are you submissive? All women and men have submissive and even masochistic aspects woven into their identities. So what? It sounds more to me like you don't want to take responsibility for your kinky urges. So instead of admitting that you get turned on by anonymous sex, you went into a dream allowing him to drive the encounter so you didn't have to take responsibility for your wish to be taken in this way. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with your urges. We're all animals by nature. We are all closet sluts and gigolos and axe murderers and so on. But what separates us from the animals is our ability to use our brains to override the wild beast within, to separate our urges from our actions. So even though it's a great turn on to screw a stranger on a sink, you need to think because you need to ask yourself if you're willing to allow your impulses to run roughshod over your reason. Do you want to have anonymous sex? Do you want to have an open relationship? Or do you want to remain in a secure monogamous relationship in which you spice it up with some fun role playing? So this would give you the best of both worlds. And if the latter is your wish, then you might consider being a little more inventive with your boyfriend. Do some sexy role playing. And this way you can incorporate your wild side into the safety of a monogamous relationship. Lots of couples love to do that. And you could dress up. You could have a little sync role play. You know, have some fun, but control your behavior. You need to keep it in your pants, too. All right. You know, I was just going to give you a little um, interesting tidbit about honesty is the best policy, because that's what we're talking about today in one form or another. Where did that phrase come from? 
you know, it should be obvious that um, it means telling the truth is always the best option. And we say this because one lie is told and it's likely to lead to another lie having to be told, which will most likely lead to another lie and so on. And eventually the truth does come out and it will not be without trouble because all the lies will be discovered and less trouble would have happened if no lies were told. Now, there are some people who say the origin of this phrase is, phrase is Poor Richard's Almanac by Ben Franklin. And this quote does sound like something Franklin may have written, but there's no evidence coming from him. And even if he did include the phrase, honest is the best policy in Poor Richard's Almanac, the phrase apparently has an earlier origin um, from the same year that Franklin was born. And many people think the phrase originated from Shakespeare. From the quote, honesty is the best policy. If I lose my honor, I lose myself. Now, the phrase did originate during Shakespeare's lifetime, but he didn't write it either. Um, He said, if I lose my honor, I lose myself. And that was in uh, scene four of Antony and Cleopatra. But it's not preceded by the phrase, preceded by the phrase, honesty is the best policy. It came in, in 1599 in the writing of Sir Edwin Sandys, and he was a prominent English politician in the Virginia Company, and he founded the settlement of Jamestown in America. And his writing is called the Europei Speculum, and it says, our gross conceits who think honesty the best policy. Well, don't believe everything you read, because as I've explained to you today, Honesty is not always the best policy, and sometimes it's an actual loaded missile. So use your brain, use your observing ego, decide whether what you're going to say is simply a self-gratification, an event of aggression, or whether it truly will benefit you, your partner, and the relationship. All right, I will see you next week on Ask Dr. Love Radio. I've had fun being with you, and good night, Seattle. 